Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gill at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Paul Turner, who is a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at Yale University and microbiology faculty member at Yale School of Medicine. He studies evolutionary genetics of viruses, particularly phages that infect bacterial pathogens and RNA viruses transmitted by anthropods. Paul's honors include fellowship in the National Academy of Sciences, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and American Academy of Microbiology. Welcome, Paul. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. So I want to start with one of your recent papers uh, entitled Phage Therapy, a Renewed Approach to Combat Antibiotic Resistance Bacteria, uh, in which you say phage therapy, long overshadowed by clinical antibiotics, is garnering renewed interest in Western medicine. This stems from the rise in frequency of multidrug resistant bacterial infections in humans. There also have been recent case reports of phage therapy demonstrating clinical utility in resolving these otherwise intractable infections. So, so before we get into the details of this, Paul, um, what exactly is a phage? Yeah, so uh, a phage is a virus. Yeah. And certainly viruses need no introduction right now as we're grappling with the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. But uh, a phage is special because it is a kind of a virus that can only infect a bacterium. So uh, this means that it is something that you might encounter in your food, your water, or even the air that you breathe, but it does no harm to you because it can't enter your cells. It can only infect bacteria. Okay. And so do we know, um, you know if you rewind time back uh, to the beginning of, <laughs> beginning of life, do we know if, uh, if phages uh, st- started off or, or uh, single cell organisms started off? Uh, my understanding is that virus requires um, single cell organisms to essentially replicate, right? Mm-hmm. That's true. <clears throat> so this is the tricky thing when you consider how do viruses evolutionarily you know, originate? And where do they come from? And I'll tell you honestly, there are many good ideas and they are not what you'd call mutually exclusive. So they could be right. Let me just uh, tell you a couple of the main ones. Uh, Life has been on this planet for billions of years. And the question is whether prior to that cellular life, you had things that were virus-like and that they are still here to today. And that's called the ancient virosphere idea where you still see viruses in our environments today that have hallmarks of way, way back, even before cellular life evolved. Now, the other main idea that is not mutually exclusive is that cellular life gives rise to viruses all the time. In other words, they sort of split off or bud off from cellular life and become viruses that are reliant on cells, but they are no longer cells. So this is the two main ideas, I think, for what you'd call virus origins. Okay. And so, so there was also some, I, I guess there is no, no support for this, uh, that uh, 
I guess it's a larger question where it came from uh, from extraterrestrial <laughs> mm. uh, origins, uh, but there is no support for anything like that, right? Yeah, not not yet. I yeah. mean, we may see uh, some support for what are sometimes called panspermia hypotheses, or you know, did life originate here, or did it get seeded on yeah. Earth from some other place? And the more that we search for life within our solar system and signs of life elsewhere, then this could eventually tell us that life did not originate here on Earth, or it may indicate that life has multiple origins in different places right. when you look off Earth. Okay. And so so the beauty of phages is that they they actually, the, the hosts for them uh, are, are bacteria, right? Mm-hmm. And so so we could potentially use them to, to kill uh, harmful bacteria to us, right? That's right. So if you imagine, and this is not imagination, it's the truth, many drugs are no longer effective in killing bacteria, antibiotics. I'm sure we'll talk about that in a moment. But yes, the specificity of phages to kill particular kinds of bacteria has always been kind of an attractive idea, even back in circa 1917 or so, when people first discovered phages. They were thinking, oh, well, this is interesting. If they're so specific to bacteria, maybe they could be used in a way to kill bacteria. Mm -hmm. And that's the approach that is called phage therapy. Okay. So so the the mechanism there is they're essentially going in, they're hijacking the 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 machinery uh, of the bacterium and then using that to replicate themselves. Uh, just like, I mean, there's a lot, lot in the news, as you say, uh, about COVID. And the mechanism there is essentially the same, right? In this case, uh, the human is the host. That's right. So <clears throat> many viruses have this, what's called a replication cycle. If they get in the cell, they can take over the molecular machinery of that cell to make copies. So the cool thing about phage therapy, if you think about that efficiency of making particles within a cell is that you could have what's called a self-amplifying drug. You could mm-hmm. give somebody this phage and it uh, finds the target bacterium that are causing, the target bacteria causing a problem. And it's different than a lot of the other, well, basically different than any other drug that we use in medicine, because in this case, the drug can make copies of itself. That's very efficient. Right, right. And so, so one of the issues, as you say, is um, perhaps because of overuse, perhaps because of other issues. I know that many pharmaceutical companies uh, sort of got out of the antibacterial um, R&D process uh, for economic reasons a yes. uh, long time ago. And so we, have, we are coming, approaching a situation where conventional antibiotics are getting more resistant and uh, we are finding um, organisms that don't really react to any um, any any available antibiotics, right? That's, so that's right. So the the, the paper talks about uh, the potential for sort of a combination therapy, if I understand it mm-hmm. correctly. Yes. Yeah. The nice thing about phage therapy is it can often be used alongside yeah. traditional approaches. In other words, it doesn't interfere with it. But the kind of phage therapy that we've been developing is particularly good as a combination because if you find the right phage, you can kill the bacteria, but it can also kind of exert selection pressure on those Mm. bacteria to escape phage attack by evolving in a way that makes them give up something that's good for them as a pathogen. They can Mm. be switching to antibiotic sensitivity. They could be switching to being less virulent or less dangerous to people. So that's sort of our approach is uh, you have kind of old classic phage therapy and the way to update it is to find particular phages that not only kill the bacteria but they steer the evolution of the bacteria in a direction that makes them fine to be bundled together with existing uh, approved therapies things like antibiotics and kind of re rejuvenating or kind of reinvigorating our outdated increasingly useless antibiotic arsenal Okay, so so when I think about evolution, Paul, I think about longer periods of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so is it possible for, uh, so, so let's say, you know, uh, we have a patient, um, the patient is not responding to antibiotics. Uh, the patient is treated with phage, uh, some sort of phage therapy. Uh, 
that makes that bacteria more sensitive to to antibiotics uh, and then um, you know you can prov- you can give that patient antibiotics and recover uh, is it possible to do that in such short time period so what what exactly uh, could we do yes so that's a great question so then let me um, address it a couple of ways yeah so basically if you have a phage that is just so efficient at killing the bacteria this could work in and of itself, if it just wallops the bacterial population and prevents it from growing in response. But that's a bit naive. And why is that? Because bacteria are very good at evolving very quickly. And one way that they can evolve quickly is to escape the phage attack. So Mm -hmm. what we would want to do is deliver uh, the phage plus an antibiotic that may be currently useless. But if we're delivering the phage and that antibiotic together, then uh, yes, the evolution could be very rapid even within the human patient wow. so, that, so that the phage kills the bacteria and the remaining bacteria that have evolved resistance to the phage are now vulnerable to the antibiotic or less dangerous for the human. And, you know, in many cases, the patient may have an active immune system or a way to fight off a bacterial infection if it gets to a low level. So mm-hmm. all that combined together can lead to an eradication of the infection um, using this approach, whereas antibiotics alone can't do it. Right, right. And, and you know, one of the concerns um, of antibiotics also is its effect on the microbiome. Yes. And, and presumably, if we are on phage therapy, that also could have some, some effects on the microbiome, right? So right. Uh, do we know more about that? Or yeah. We're getting more and more information every day. So what you said is very true. We have relied a lot on what are called broad spectrum antibiotics, which might kill your infection that's causing you a disease. But the problem is we now know that there are very many uh, useful bacteria that exist in your microbiome, and that could be collateral damage. Some of that is not easily replaced. So the point there is that somebody who's on on antibiotic therapy, especially over a long period of time, can have a low quality of life because their microbiome is suffering. So instead, um, yes, what you said earlier is if you deliver a phage, it could work only against the target bacterium, but it could kill some of those bacteria in your helpful microbiome. Yeah. The possibilities for that are so much less than Mm. the already problematic issue of using broad spectrum antibiotics that that kind of an effect We're not naively thinking it can't happen, but it definitely should not be as problematic as a broad spectrum drug that you take to kill a pathogen and does all this collateral damage to your microbiome. So I'm quite optimistic that phage therapy can continue to improve and move forward, and we won't have too many of these problems with the microbiome being adversely affected. Okay, so, so, in, so in general, we can have a higher level of specificity uh, with, with, with the phage. Um, we can obviously custom design it, but at least we can mm-hmm. custom select it. That's for, right. Okay. That's right. So you can engineer, or my laboratory, we do all sorts of microbial evolution studies, so we could take a phage and evolve it to be a better killer of the target. But uh, what you said is very important for the listeners to remember, is the specificity of phages is an awesome tool because Mm. you can go in and carve out something that shouldn't be there. The liability is that if it's too specific, then delivering a phage to you or somebody else who has the same bacterial disease, maybe that phage is ineffective if your particular variant of that bacterium is different than say mine, if I'm experiencing phage therapy. So a big goal of ours is to find generalized approaches with phage therapy that aren't as broad as broad spectrum antibiotics, but they're broad enough that you could have a physician distributing phages for therapeutic use where you don't always have to be characterizing the exact variant that the patient is suffering from, from an infection. Okay. Yeah. So this is totally on a tangent, Paul. I was just thinking, um, is there any utility in, in cancer? Uh, if phages yeah. are able to sort of disrupt a biological system yes. in some fashion. Uh, yeah, do we, do we know anything about that? Yeah, I mean, some people are pursuing that very vigorously, and the early data do look good. Mm-hmm. Um, let me say two things about it. The first is if you take a phage and alter it in some way 
that it is not targeting a bacterium, it might be able to target specific cells in your body that are non-bacterial, especially cancer cells. Mm. Now, it wouldn't necessarily, well, we think it wouldn't be able to replicate in those cells, but it might be able to deliver mm. something to those cells that would cause the cells to be destroyed. So in this way, it's kind of like the phage is a, it's, a, it's carrying some cargo with it mm. that mm. would do damage to the cancer. And then the other thing I was going to mention is the analogy to phage therapy is if you have a virus that can infect your cells, but it can only infect the cancerous ones. That's called oncolytic virus mm. therapy or cancer destroying virus therapy. And that's a little harder because these viruses can replicate in your cells, but you have to engineer them or find the ones that are naturally only capable of growing in cancer cells and not on your normal tissue. So that, that approach is actually advancing in the clinic and in uh, experiments as well. I would say not as quickly as phage therapy for the obvious reasons is that you have to have a, a lot of care in using those approaches because these, those viruses can replicate in your own cells. Right, right. Yeah, so, so going back to uh, phage therapy uh, within your lab, uh, so are there, um, are there uh, trials going on? Uh, are they getting into human trials and so on? Yes, there's, there's two things that we're doing. Before the human trials, we've been doing a yeah. lot of personalized treatments. So we have found phages that work against uh, drug-resistant bacteria, and uh, we learned that there are very, very many people who are suffering from chronic bacterial infections that are multi-drug or pan-drug resistant. So they literally have no options left. And we've been using phages in what's called uh, Food and Drug Administration, FDA-approved compassionate use, where you mm. deliver the phage to somebody before it's been approved as a general drug because you're trying to save their organs or their life. So the ultimate approach, though, is you use all that knowledge you learn from those patients, you save some organs or some lives along the way. And we're quite um, happy that that's occurred. But the real end game goal is to do what is called a clinical trial, where you look at the general safety and efficacy. And we have uh, an FDA approved clinical trial coming up. We hope to do it in January, where we're essentially looking at phages delivered to the human lung to protect <laughs> the human lung against the invasion of bacterial pathogens in a, in a way that uh, that's called prophylaxis, so a way that yeah. uh, protects the human lung. These are all RNA-based viruses, right? Well, in our case, I do a lot of... I'm, my, my laboratory is a little uh, unusual in microbiology yeah. because I, I study literally a microbial zoo, including some mm. RNA viruses. <laughs> but yeah. uh, historically, and in my laboratory, phage therapy has gravitated to... DNA viruses, oh, DNA okay. phages. So actually in our yeah. case, yeah, we use a lot of DNA phages. We're open to the idea of using RNA phages, but uh, currently we're only using DNA phages for therapy. So could you, could you gene edit them to, to customize them? Absolutely. So there are many ways that you could engineer the genetics of a phage so that it could be a broader killer. So it could be uh, more targeted to a specific target a binding site on bacteria. So the interesting thing about it is, in our case, we're largely looking at the vast biodiversity of phages on this planet that is naturally evolved. And we are using that with the FDA approval. And it's a funny thing that if you engineer phages, they then become uh, categorized as genetically um, recombinant. And there's a yeah. few more hurdles to putting them into people or to do a clinical trial. So we are going down the path currently of non-engineered phages, but your, your question is spot on. You could change phages so that they do some job better. And in our case, we're not quite doing that yet because we find that there's a little bit more of a barrier to putting them into compassionate use and into clinical trials. Right, right, because of the uncertainty associated with them. Um, right. I want to go into one of the older papers, Paul. So mm -hmm. it's entitled Prisoner's Dilemma in the RNA Virus. Yes. And uh, really, you know, <laughs> I find it very interesting coming oh, from economics you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and game theory. Yeah. So you say that the evolution of competitive interactions among viruses was studied in the RNA phage mm -hmm. at high and low multiplicities uh, of infection. Mm 
Um, and so, so, so you're looking at how phages are evolving, competing, and you find some similarities that we could potentially predict from um, from game theoretic frameworks. Right? Right. So do you want to talk a bit about that? Sure, happy to. So one of the, um, this was a paper that we published back in 1999. And at that time, there's a lot of understanding that multiple viruses can get into the same cell. But what yeah. we showed in that paper is if you evolve them in that kind of an environment where they're constantly seeing other viruses in the cell, they can evolve some pretty interesting strategies that are analogous to cheating, where they mm -hmm. replicate in the cell, but they don't have to do it very efficiently because they can steal proteins and other things that viruses that are different from them bring into the cell. So in mm -hmm. this way, they get a bit um, enamored of that process, and uh, <laughs> they become so dependent on it that they are not very good at growing in a cell on their own. So when we right. looked at this scenario, we thought, hmm, this is similar to game theory models where you look at interactions between individuals and if you have so-called irrational behavior or cheating you can mm. sometimes win even though ultimately you'll lose that you haven't gained as much but in the short term you've outcompeted your competitor and because you've cheated off of right. them. so right. in the end we were able to do these experiments with phages in the laboratory and prove a very popular game called prisoner's dilemma can actually be shown to occur in a biological population and just to say it briefly yeah. this is when you know if you have two prisoners in different holding cells and they're known to have committed a crime they have these yeah. different strategies in confessing to the authorities and the point is that if they point their finger at one another it's their only opportunity to go free but if they're known to do this crime and they point their finger at one another they may do a very um, you know stiffer jail sentence so in right. the end those game theory models predict that it it pays to be selfish and we yeah. showed that in viruses <laughs> in virus evolution it also pays to be selfish and they can win the race ultimately even though in the end they're left with no other viruses to cheat on and their fitness suffers from it but nothing prevents them from taking over the population hmm. So, so selfishness then uh, sort of a programmatic trait. I, I used to think that it's just politicians. <laughs> yes. uh, you know. Sadly, it's more universal than that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and so, so that uh, does that give us any sort of uh, design um, advantage? Uh, because we know their their natural instincts in an environment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, could be. Could we influence that in some ways? At least we can predict what the outcomes are going to be. Yes, I, I'd say yeah. two things to that. So one yeah. is the kind of research that I described. Maybe the listeners are like, well, that's kind of cute. It's an economic model, and you prove it with phages. And yes, it, it was a fun study, but it's actually true. We learned later, other researchers have learned, that some pathogenic viruses of humans, they cheat off of other viruses within... Mm the human body in order to gain an advantage and they are the ones that end up causing the disease. So this is mm. something that's seen in dengue virus, for example, which is a virus that's transmitted by mosquitoes. So that's cool. You know, it says that the basic research that we did points to some realities of, oh, well, viruses do see one another inside of cells and they can adopt interesting strategies. Now, the other mm. one is it sort of shows a vulnerability that you could take advantage of. If you put purposefully in the human body, some cheater form of a virus that does very poorly on its own, but it yeah. outcompetes pathogenic viruses in your cells, then you might right. be able to put it in the human body and it drives the pathogenic virus out. That's sort of without the gory details, the, right. the, uh, the approach. And people are chasing that down as, uh, as a valid way to do therapy against viral diseases. Mm. So maybe we can teach viruses some mathematics. Yes, and, uh, and you know, <laughs> <laughs> and gain an upper hand that way. I agree. Okay. <laughs> this exciting research, um, Paul. We'll take a quick break, and when we come back, we talk about the the other papers that you have. This is a scientific sense podcast, providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info 
at scientificsense.com. So we are back. Um, so Paul, we were talking about viruses and how we could potentially use virus um, phages, um, more, more commonly called, uh, to counteract bacterial infection, maybe in combination therapy with other antibacterial chemical agents, mm-hmm. or even use them in competition with other harmful viruses inside the body. So it's a very, very rich and interesting area and mm-hmm. developing area. Uh, I want to get into another paper that you have in this area. It's entitled Virus Population Extinction via Ecological Traps. Mm-hmm. So you say populations are at risk of extinction when unsuitable or, even, or when sink habitat exceeds the threshold frequency in the environment. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that's, that sounds intuitive. Um, so, so, so could we use that understanding in some way to control them? Is that the idea? Yeah, the main idea is that viruses kind of have a big problem and can we capitalize on it? They essentially yeah. rely on bombardment with cells that are of the right type. Yeah. They bind and they enter and then they can replicate inside that cell. But what happens if they hit the wrong cell type and stick? Mm. And if they can't replicate in those cells, then if this is happening too much, then that population of viruses is going to click into extinction. It's not going to um, uh, replace itself in the right. environment. Right. So we quickly thought of the idea, oh, that's interesting. How might you use that? therapeutically and if it's okay i'll give you a quick example yeah yeah absolutely yeah hiv is a retrovirus i'm sure the listeners have heard of hiv but hiv what it does is it gets in cells and it interacts with the nucleus of the cell and it inserts itself in the dna and the nucleus and then it uses that to help kick particles out of the cell Mm. so now the long story short is suppose it is getting in the wrong cell type where that can't occur It turns out that you have a ton more red blood cells in your body than precious other cells that viruses might infect. Mm -hmm. And the the neat thing, if the the listeners remember their biology 101, is that your red blood cells don't have a nucleus. So what we thought is, oh, could you maybe control HIV or other harmful viruses by tricking them into infecting the wrong cell type? So we went about to do an experiment called proof of concept in the laboratory where we used a phage uh, and a whole bunch of different cell types that were good and bad in terms of its replication ability. And we proved that if there are enough of these wrong cell types around, then viruses can get in them and they won't be sustained as a population and they'll click into extinction. Hmm. That's so interesting. So, so if I understand this correctly, Paul, the, the, so the, the virus gets in, it, it uh, infects a target cell, and one of the goals of the, of the infecting virus is to replicate inside that cell mm-hmm. and then come out. So, so in, in most viral infections, as we have seen, the patient goes down um, sort of an exponential fashion because you have an exponential mm-hmm. replication going on in the body. That's right. Um, so in this case, what you're saying is that you could have cells with an outward appearance of targets for mm-hmm. the virus, and it goes and infects that cell, but it can't really replicate That's in that right. cell. So it sort of works like a vacuum cleaner. That's right. right. Yeah, yeah, that is entirely correct. It's, it sucks up uh, viruses into a habitat that's not good for them, mm-hmm. and they can't be sustained for that reason. And I guess maybe what I'll add is, you know, there are some infections of viruses in your body where physicians were mostly trying to keep the level of the virus down because we might actually be hard pressed to remove it entirely. And yeah. this is how we keep people alive who are HIV infected. The what's called the viral load is kept mm. to a low level so that their immune system cells that are targeted by that virus are not destroyed entirely. Because mm. once that happens, they progress to AIDS and any pathogen that comes in they don't have an immune system to protect them and they may die from that so the the thing i should add there is that the drugs that allow that are super expensive and we were trying to think of less uh, expensive ways to achieve the same effect if you've got viruses facing extinction because you're forcing them into the wrong cell type that might be a cheaper technology than to be distributing a lifelong supply of very expensive 
uh, anti-HIV drugs in the example uh, that I used. Okay. It has to be a cell though, right? It cannot be an external agent. Can you design well, something? That... <laughs> that's a great question. So I think yeah. that it is possible to use something that is the size of a cell, but mm. um, could be used in this way to vacuum up the viruses. So this is uh, maybe where nanotechnology Mm. nanobots, you know, things like that, that the reader, uh, sorry, the listeners may have uh, heard of. So that's, yeah. that's not quite science fiction. You know, I think that's got <laughs> some, some possibilities to it. But as right. people, people might uh, think that's some pretty leading edge, difficult technology to get approved. So I think that that mm. is a lot in the idea stage. But it is kind of interesting how people are coming up with these creative ways to try and solve virus infection problems. Yeah. So if we had something like that in the in the COVID-19 mm -hmm. context here, um, so we have some time before the patient gets really sick mm -hmm. uh, for most viral infections. Right. So the, the idea here would be if you can pick it up early, you can you can stop that replication process and then you can clean it up. That is correct. Um, so ultimately, we are losing the battle um, toward the end uh, because it just an, it's a runaway replication process, right? You just yes. cannot stop it, That's and this right. might be a way to way to potentially slow it down. That is right. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, because a lot of our, our our deaths due to COVID are, as you say, it's the overwhelming of the human body with this viral load and its problems. But if you can get at the problem earlier and reduce the viral load and kind of place these barriers there for the virus to have a hard time or inability to replicate, then yeah. I mean, in principle, this can work in lots of ways. And uh, the idea is to just kind of keep going forward with technology and proof of concept experiments to see how well it might work. Yeah, I was just thinking, uh, Paul. Th this this is uh, potentially science fiction now, but, <laughs> but maybe maybe in the future we could, if it is nanotechnology based agent, one could envision a process. Uh, you know that that uh, external agent is actually also electronically equipped. That you yes. have some sort of an agent running around the body mm -hmm. um, even before the infection that can you know that can raise its hand saying i found something here yes uh, even before the infection potentially right yes that's that is uh, very true you know can you have some signal detection going yeah. on and i mean there's lots of ways we would love to improve human medicine and outcomes you know an obvious one to say is cancer you know a lot mm -hmm. of people experience cancer and your immune system actually gets rid of it without you knowing it and it's when it doesn't when uh, the problems arise but if you had a a super efficient detection system that's raising red flags, then yeah. it could work against a bunch of disease ailments, including infectious diseases, like you just said, and some uh, genetic diseases like cancers. Right, right. Yeah, I want to jump into uh, some of the more recent papers. So dynamics of molecular evolution in RNA virus populations depend on sudden versus gradual environmental change. Mm -hmm. So you say that understanding the dynamics of molecular adap adaptation is a fundamental goal of evolutionary biology. Mm -hmm. uh, while adaptation to constant environments has been well characterized, the effects of environmental complexity remain seldom studied. Mm -hmm. So, so there, here is a you know, sort of a, a, a dynamic process, and the, and the evolution, the, the environmental change could be totally stochastic, right? Totally mm -hmm. random, potentially. Yes. Uh, but how the how the virus react to that is is, is different. That's um, right. Yeah, you want to talk a bit about that? Sure. So um, first thing I'll say is all organisms on this planet, microbes and cellular organisms, face changing environments. There is no constancy yeah. out there. So the thing that we're quite good at is studying if you put an organism into a brand new environment, it may die, <laughs> or right. it might be, you know, it might be capable of limping along a bit of an existence, and then eventually it becomes adapted and better capable of using that environment. So now let's think about virus emergence, which we're dealing with a lot with this pandemic issue. If you yeah. have a virus in a bat or some other organism and it jumps directly into humans, it might mm. be capable of replicating immediately and doing damage. Or the other scenario is if that's kind of happening and it peters out, uh, but what is the scenario of when you have lots of humans around 
and mm. lots of bats. And a virus can be replicating in its bat host and then occasionally replicating in humans and sort of, um, you know, increasingly becoming better in that environment without clicking into extinction because it's got mm-hmm. some ability to replicate in its normal host. So that's the... And, and yeah. we may not be picking up, we may not be even picking up the infection. That's right. That is right. Okay. So yeah. there's, there's lots of environmental scenarios that are quite complex where you think about, do you have to immediately be fit in your new environment or could you just sort of gradually increase mm-hmm. in fitness because you have the luxury of growing in your current environment? So for a virus growing in a reservoir species like a bat versus growing in a novel species like a human. So we wanted to do a study that examines if you have this kind of variety of scenarios, does it matter for the kinds of genetic changes that a virus undergoes to become better adapted to its new host? And we found that it matters a lot. That if you you just sort of take a virus or some biological entity and throw it into a new environment, there's a certain set of genetic changes that it must have at its disposal when it enters that environment to succeed. Mm -hmm. But that's very different than if it sort of occasionally uses that environment, becomes better adapted over time. There's a different set of genetic rules that apply and different mutations that allow that to happen. And that had not been well studied before we produced this paper on it. Mm. That's so interesting. So the, from, uh, if I understand this correctly, Paul, from the virus's perspective, um, it is running different experiments and in some sense learning from those experiments and become more potent over time in a different host. Mm-hmm. So this has a lot of implications. You know, we talked a lot about the wet markets in China, again, going back to the COVID mm-hmm. uh, issue that we're dealing with right now. It's not if the, if I understand this correctly, it's not just that you know something jumps and you know pandemic starts. Uh, it's really a lot of priming going on. That's right. Uh, is that is that what you? That's mean? very true. So imagine in a wet market, a virus yeah. that could jump into humans, if it must jump in immediately, versus if there's some way of thriving in that market. Let's just let me just take a you know, a complete example yeah. for which I have no evidence it ever occurs. But <laughs> yeah. imagine uh, you know there are feral dogs or cats wandering around that market if it's Mm -hmm. possible for the virus to be kind of growing very well in these other animals and then spilling over occasionally into humans it's sort of like this big population that you don't know is there which has the luxury of grooming as you were saying to be better capable of jumping into humans and we we just don't quite know we don't have Mm -hmm. the these rules uh figured out so this is a great reminder that we are suffering through a pandemic that we will make it through eventually. But along the way, we are getting some pretty creative ideas about how did this pandemic come about? But more importantly, how can you predict future epidemics and pandemics in light of these sort of rules that we would like to uh, disentangle and figure out in the virus emergence world? Yeah, so it is It is kind of scary <laughs> in some ways, right? So, uh, you know, uh, it's it's not a shock that is just, you know, just happens and then pandemic starts. It, it is really something that has been, you know, sort of designed over a long time mm-hmm. and, and something happens. So, so from an intervention perspective, the question will be, and let me ask you this before I get there. Uh, every, every flu season, we get a new type of flu, right? That's why we have the flu vaccine right. uh, are different. And... Uh, is it true to um, uh, to assume that the, the origin of that flu every season is somewhere in uh, East Asia or something like that, or that is not really proven? That's not quite proven yet. It's it's okay. still pretty tricky where these flu variants first arise. But the yeah. the expectation is, you know, these are flu variants that circulate in humans, so you probably have this happening in the most populated parts of the world. And that would be many of the places in Asia. So it's just a numbers game. You know, where mm-hmm. would you expect this to happen? You expect it to happen in the populated regions. Yeah. So, so would you suggest then from an intervention perspective, I don't know if it's possible that you probably need random testing of humans or even other animals in, wow. in locations even before you identify an infection, if this is true, right? Yeah. Or can, can we actually do that? So this is, this is great. I'm glad you brought it up. That's called yeah. surveillance. 
So yeah. if you knew in some region, you suspected that this is a place where virus emergence could occur, could you yeah. kind of uh, survey that environment and the species within it to look for the dangerous ones? So that was a very easy thing to say, but it takes so much time, energy, and money to do it that we really need a different kind of a technology that mm -hmm. would uh, have us efficiently doing surveillance because it's just, it's so hard to figure out that lurking set of pathogens amidst the so many more viruses that do you no harm at all. Mm -hmm. So yes, right. we're living through a pandemic. Yes, uh, we're reminded of the power of viruses to cause disease. But uh, a reminder also is that you see lots of viruses every day probably and they don't cause you any harm and they can't replicate in your cells and you, know, you, and you almost need them right in some cases you need them to exactly to really, so that yeah. that's really you know you hear a lot about the microbiome where this yeah. information is dominated by bacteria that are studied to find out how do they benefit your health and we are really not nearly as close in figuring out the virome that you naturally harbor and whether some of those inhabitants of your virome do you some good. Maybe they are kind of priming your system mm. to be uh, better uh, able to withstand attack from nasty viruses. That's called cross resistance. So there's lots of mm. ways that your virome could be benefiting you in some ways that we, we, we just don't know yet. And, and so, so it's also the interplay between the microbiome and the and the viral biome, mm -hmm. I don't know what the right term would be, right? Yes. So they are coexisting mm -hmm. in an environment, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, that is the case. And, and so, and so the real question is, how, how is that? Um, how is that dance done, really? Yes. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Lar largely, the assumption is it's done through what's called coevolution. So you have, yeah. um, it's very famously described as the uh, often as a red queen hypothesis from Alice in Wonderland, where the Red Queen says to Alice, it takes all the running in place you can do in order to stand still. And the point is, you could have in your virome and microbiome these sort of uh, enemies of one another. You can have bacteria that are infected naturally by phage that are killing them. And this is causing the bacteria to evolve better means of resistance to the phage. And then the phage evolves better ways to kill the bacteria. And they're locked in this co-evolutionary battle and nobody is winning and they're just sort of sustained over time. So that helps us at least conceptually think of how is it you can have bacteria, viruses, all sorts of complexities in your microbiome. So these species are around perpetually, but they're changing genetically along the way. Hmm. And, and so let me ask you this. So the, the diseases that, you know, some of the diseases that we attribute to sort of the microbiome issues, mm -hmm. um, there also seems to me that there is a, sort of a fine balance between the, the viral agents and the bacterial agents in the, in the gut, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And so anything that shifts that balance, so to speak, um, could result in diseases that um, <laughs> you know, that could be even new in some That's ways. That's right. So th this is the such, it's the immensity of information in your microbiome and the difficulty of sorting through it to make sense of it is really at the heart of this issue. So you have individual to individual, if you look at their microbiomes and viromes, you know, they look somewhat alike unless they don't. <laughs> and, you know, how much, <laughs> yeah. how much is your diet affecting that, your age? I mean, there's lots of things. But what yeah. you alluded to uh, at least I'm familiar with the term called dysbiosis. So if you have mm. kind of this complexity of a community of microbes that's doing you some good, what happens if the relative ratio of those species is off? And is this the, you know, the, the smoking gun, if you will, for some very difficult to understand diseases that are highly prevalent, irritable bowel disease? I mean, all kinds of things mm. seem to be related to this. So the, the question is, how do you figure out what is the typical healthy state and how do you understand what is the dysbiosis or the aberrant state when mm. person to person the just the microbiome itself can be highly variable from person to person it's very hard to figure this stuff out but it's an active area of research right right i, I want to dig a little deeper into one area here in this paper mm -hmm. uh, paul so um, the fixation, you say, the fixation of single mutations 
uh, was less common uh, than sweeps of associated cohorts of mutations. Mm -hmm. And this pattern intensified when the environment changed gradually. Yes. Could, could, could you talk a bit about that? Sure. So uh, a lot of the mutational changes that we associate with improved traits or improved fitness, uh, they could be one mutation at a time. So you sort of build yeah. a better genome and better traits one mutation at a time. But that's kind of naive because a lot of what happens in genetic systems is called interactions or the fancy word for it is epistasis. This is when genes interact with one another to cause traits. So what we studied is if you have viruses that are immediately jumping onto a new host and being fit, it's because they have some individual mutation that they carried that happened to let them do that successfully. Whereas if they are gradually evolving on that new host, again, they're able to replicate in their ordinary host and sort of spilling over occasionally onto that new host. This can mm -hmm. be uh, played out over a longer time and there's a greater opportunity for multiple mutations to work with one another to be mm -hmm. the underlying reason for those fitness improvements. So that's what surprised us is like, oh, well that kind of makes sense intuitively and now we've got some evidence that that's a general uh, observation in the system that we studied is that you've got these interacting mutations much more often if you have the luxury of this virus gradually evolving on a new host. So, so given time, they can get better, which is, which is worse for the host. That's right. So in both scenarios, yes, yes. In both scenarios. Yes. But I, I think it's, the, it's, it's kind of the appreciation of the genetics that causes that and the real life uh, you know, parallel to it is if you're grappling with some virus disease like we are now with the pandemic, you know, what, do you, what, what can you understand from that system in a way to predict? Is it single mutations that we have to be worried about or is it lots of mutations scattered around the genome that, is, that are interacting with one another that really makes the virus dangerous? So there's an insight there. Right, right. Yeah, so I want to uh, finish up with um, COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, so just thinking about, you know, let, let me know if this is right. Um, so there might have been multiple mutations or multiple versions of COVID-19 mm -hmm. in the population, yes. right? And uh, if that is true, some of them could have been more, um, more potent compared to the others. There is an inverse relationship between potency and and, and survival, mm. right? If if the virus is killing the host very quickly, it cannot really survive. So, in a system where there are multiple, uh, you know, uh, different different potent organisms uh, infecting people, mm -hmm. over time, would we expect the more potent one to die out and then the more transmissible one to, to become more? Yeah, potent? it's really a, a beautiful question because we have abundant mathematical theory, we have abundant ideas about this, but we yeah. have not nearly as much hard data, even in experiments in the laboratory, or to grapple with the real scenario that we are dealing with right now. So the, everything you said is true. So if you have a virulent and a less virulent or less dangerous pathogen duking it out, fighting within the host organism, uh, it could be that the more dangerous one wins just because it grows faster. But right. what becomes important is as it exits the host and goes to infect a new one, is there some liability of being so hard on your current host that you mm. end up being less transmissible to a new host? So right. I guess what I'm saying is lots of traits of infectious pathogens matter, and it's going to be the combination that they face for some traits to improve, some to be changed over time, that kind of adds up to the ultimate success of this pathogen. And then when you layer into it, well, how many available hosts are there, which we're trying to ultimately reduce through vaccination? You know, if you reduce the number of people who can get infected, ideally you're going to push a pathogen into such an intimacy that it needs to uh, replicate in its current host and not do so much damage because there's not so many new hosts around to infect. And in that way, the hope is that you know, you're kind of pushing the pathogen to be less dangerous 
unless you're not. <laughs> because, because there are other ideas about how if vaccines don't work as effectively, you can have the, the opposite outcome is that you are kind of, uh, you know, improving the ability of the most dangerous ones to escape the vaccine. And you're sort of pushing the virus or some pathogens into a more dangerous state. So let me just state emphatically, I'm a big believer in vaccines yeah. and uh, <laughs> that uh, the, the, the thing is, as a proximate issue, we have to get the pandemic under control and vaccines are our best approach to do that. But I think my main point here is over time, the use of vaccines in any disease system can change. You might find that the kind of vaccine you use is more or less effective depending on what's happening in the current state of that disease. And uh, that's why vaccinology or the study of vaccines is a very, you know, it's, it's a well-researched field because it can change over time. Yeah, so, so I was, you know, uh, thinking about the, the population-wide metrics. Uh, for example, we see uh, case fatality, and I'm talking about COVID-19 mm -hmm. now, yes. um, case, case fatality rate dropping, and, you know, politicians use it for, for various uh, purposes. <laughs> yes. uh, but but ca case fatality dropping could be for, due to a variety of reasons. Right. Could be one reason is what we just discussed, which is the, the virulence or potency is reducing. It could be a denominator effect. Uh, maybe the average age of infected patients is declining. Exactly. Maybe, you know, we learned how to treat this disease better. There could be a variety of reasons. But if you look at worldwide data, Paul, do we have any sense that the, the first hypothesis, uh, you know, do we see that that, that could be true? In yeah, so we, we see some evidence that this virus changes genetically. That's not that's surprising. Viruses do change genetically. Yeah. But this is a this is not a virus that seems to be doing it very, very rapidly. It's not like flu virus, which changes so quickly that each year mm -hmm. we have to come up with a different vaccine to fight it. So that's the good news is that, OK, if you've got some mutational genetic change. It doesn't surprise me. But is it really, um, is it doing any more harm? No, because you reminded us that overall case fatality, case fatality rates are going down. My personal yeah. uh, take on that is I think the, the, the way that we treat patients, especially in the hospitals, we've learned so much from so many patients that we've refined our approaches on a global level. And that has definitely... <laughs> contributed to the better path of therapy uh, and treatment, you know, just strategies that we use depending on how far along the person's disease state is, what kind of, you know, signals are they showing within the hospital. So the, the problem is, you know, everything that you mentioned could be happening at the same time. Right. And to disentangle the complexities of what is driving it the most, we'll figure it out one day. But at least the, <laughs> at least the data are going in the right direction, right? You, you want to have fewer yeah. people suffering from this uh, through mortality. And, and fortunately, that's the case. But it is good news that, um, that the mutation rate or the evolutionary rate of this organism is, is yes. lower compared to, the, compared to at least the flu That's virus. right, because it suggests that we don't have to be on this constant uh, treadmill that we are on with flu and uh, trying to get new vaccines every year based on the available data and trying to make a prediction that is not always accurate. Sometimes you get a lot of flu deaths in any one year because we build up our vaccine stocks and they may not be the best match. So what you want to do is grapple with a disease agent with a vaccine where that disease agent is not changing very rapidly on you. And so far, so good with uh, the vaccine approaches that are moving along with COVID-19, sars coronavirus 2 you know, We should be able to get a handle on it and not have, uh, ideally not have the virus escape through genetic mutation to avoid those vaccines quickly. Right. So, so in conclusion, Paul, let me ask you a policy mm -hmm. question. A um, lot of people actually, not, not a lot, but some people had predicted this um, mm -hmm. with fair, fair level of uh, detail, mm -hmm. I would say. Uh, there have been people around the world um, looking at data. We had a plan um, to, to counteract an upcoming pandemic. Mm -hmm. Uh, we seem to have um, done a really, really bad job mm -hmm. of it this time mm -hmm. around. So from a policy perspective, as you look forward, um, first of all, 
uh, I would think that we are going to get this again. Oh, maybe yes. not COVID twenty, you know, COVID twenty one, maybe COVID twenty one. And so, so what? What are the things you would say that we have to we we, we can learn from our mistakes and look forward? What are the things that we should really focus mm-hmm. so on? So, first one is now we have a very very healthy respect for coronaviruses and their ability to emerge. Yes. So we got lucky with SARS coronavirus one. We got lucky with this virus abbreviated as MERS, which is a relative of it. And SARS coronavirus two has caused the pandemic. So now, you know, I. I have no doubts that, you know, we're, we're not going to be surprised by <laughs> coronaviruses again because we're going to be watching them like a hawk. And uh, yeah. but back to the policy issue, we are learning lessons from different populations around the world about how they are successfully and unsuccessfully dealing with this problem. Now, the hope <laughs> is that at a global level, we're sharing this information and going to learn our lessons from it. But you know, this is where policy and putting it in action you know, these we grapple with this in different societies, yeah. depending on what the, the cultures yeah. and the norms are. So I, I'm hopeful that the study of emerging pathogens, including these dangerous viruses, is improving a lot. I think we're going to put more attention to public health measures, the ways to control yeah. epidemics, because, you know, that, that hasn't been a huge focus because we've been lucky and not dealing with it too, too much other than, you know, the occasional outbreaks of Ebola virus and the ongoing problems of malaria and dengue virus, et cetera. So we have a lot of information from a lot of systems, but now we've, we've learned just how bad it could be, especially when you have a pathogen that's dangerous. And the hardest part about this one, in my view, is you don't know who's infected because of the asymptomatic problem. So this is right. this is the thing that some people have said, you know, what would be the most difficult kind of pandemic pathogen to deal with? It would be one that kills you or not. <laughs> and you don't know, you know, prediction wise. Now we have age as an axis, but we also have, you know, um, people who are young who die from it and those who are old who survive it. So we have a lot of information to sift through still. But my main point is. As we get all this information, we do bolster our chances for the future because inevitably we are going to see more pandemics. And I'm a believer that this kind of information can only help us deal with those inevitabilities down the road. Yeah, I mean, one thing I learned from this this experience, uh, I mean, it, it should have been obvious, but every culture, as you mentioned, deals with it differently. Yes. And so, so the question in my mind is, surveillance if you do it uh, properly it is truly an international yes. problem it, it's not a you know country country specific or culture specific problem that's right and so the question then you know for world health organization or you know leaders uh, <laughs> real leaders mm-hmm. of countries would be uh, to ask the question how do we uh, so let me ask mm-hmm. you this are we investing sufficiently robustly into a surveillance no. system not yet <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> no yeah. and and the question right. is how much money and, you know, would make it, um, you know, as ideal as possible. So I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I, I think that uh, it's yeah. something we aspire to do. I don't know that we quite know how to do surveillance yeah. efficiently, but it's got, as you said, it's got to be a world effort. You know, there are some things that transcend countries' right. boundaries, and this is definitely one of them. So it's a, it's a great indicator of human populations, different societies, different cultures, some things we just have to work together on. And this is one of them. Yeah. Yeah. So the other thing obviously related is that intervention policies, country by country and some large countries, state by state, it's a losing idea, right? I mean, you yeah. know, it's not like you're going to contain this when, when there is so much yes. movement of 8.3 billion people across the across that the world. True. So 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 it goes back to some sort of an international effort mm-hmm. an international organization coordinating mm-hmm. it and 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 really data has to be looked at coming from all parts of the world if you're going to do it. I agree. Right? And I let me just drop one more thing into the conversation here. Yeah. You know, a lot of our infrastructure that contributes to this worldwide travel, you know, how is it going to change post pandemic? How will airports change for for ways of screening passengers? I've been to plenty of airports where they 
this was pre-pandemic where they just take your your fever, right? They check your temperature. <laughs> and you know, none of them that I know of are in the United States. These are places uh, elsewhere internationally that I've experienced. So the, yeah. the question is how much can that change? How, come much, how, how can uh, international trade and movement of goods, which can move pathogens around as well, especially in reservoir species, how can greater conservation efforts, how could different policies about wet markets you know, improve our ability to um, protect ourselves against this yeah. inevitability in the future? And I, I think uh, we better do a lot, but we are going to do a lot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the good thing is uh, anything that, that doesn't kill us all uh, might give us That's good right. information. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And uh, pandemics do end, and this one will end. And yeah. we stand to gain a lot of information from it, but we, of course, are trying to save lives along the way so that we don't lose our, uh, you know, well, we don't lose our fellow um, people and in the process. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Excellent. Excellent, Paul. This has been cool, great. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much uh, Yeah, for spending time with me. Oh, I'm happy to. Thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, right. thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.